Hello again, I'm just saying Victoria here with the Lonely Entrepreneur. Welcome everybody. Um, the first of our funding um, series uh, calls. Um, we're gonna give it another minute or two for folks to jump on um, an opportunity to join. Um, so obviously most of us here <laughs> are looking for funding in one way or another. Um, so we'll get into, you know, deep conversations around, you know, what it really takes to, to secure funding for your business, whether or not you and your business are ready, right? The process, um, documents, and, and, and everything that you need to, to put yourself in a position for a best chance of success. Um, and we have Michael who's joining us here. Hi, Michael. Hi, hi. How are you? Doing good. Um, so as we wait for folks to jump on, um, you see more people are joining. I thought they would be good. And, you know, obviously uh, you have raised um, a lot of money back when you were building your business. Um, what was the hardest thing about raising money? Um, you know, all, all money raising is hard. Anybody tells you, and everybody tells stories that, ah, you know, I just walked into a bar and scratched the number on a napkin and there was a bag of cash outside. That just doesn't ever happen. Right. Um, or I went to one meeting and secured funding, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. We, we had a, a pretty straightforward process. Um, and I'll share that a little bit later. I think the hardest part is that there's two hard parts. Number one, is you're doing something new, right? So it's it's the old pattern bias thing, right? People haven't seen it before, so they can't get their arms around it. And and but you're also marrying that with the fact that if it's not new, people aren't that interested in it, right? So you're striking this delicate balance between something that people can understand, and yet it's new enough and different enough that that people go, wow, that's something that's something different. Um, I think the second part of it is understanding that an early stage company has flaws by definition, right? You don't have all the capital and the resources that you need. And I think, I think one of the most important things you have to be able to do is not resist those flaws, but do some of the things that hopefully we're gonna talk about here to get people excited about what you're doing, but have a plan for the flaws, right? And, and almost to, and this is gonna sound crazy, proactively bring them up, right? right? Proactively said, you know, we, you know, with the money we, we have, we're, you know, we need to build out this capability and that capability and you know, we don't have it. And a lot of times I think um, early stage founders are really resistant to say, well, I don't want to show them all of our problems. Every investor that's worth his or her salt knows, knows that there's flaws. They just want a leader that can um, direct their funding to the things that are going to make a difference and ultimately, um, you know, drive the business forward. So those are, I think, the hardest things V for for are, are just those things are somewhat counterintuitive. Yep. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, especially um, the second one. Yeah. So because we we may have a smaller group today, uh, which is great for a discussion like this, I just want to go around and um, you know have people uh, tell us a little bit about. Um, their business because I think it'll kind of set up the stage for conversations, you know, about your specific business and how you're thinking about, you know, money raising funding for, um, so we'll go there. Um, hi, Nicole. Hello, hello. Obviously, Good afternoon. we know your business. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Beautiful yes. dolls that you make. <laughs> yes, I'm Nicole Hawthorne, co-founder of Jayla's Heirlooms with my four-year-old Jayla, and we create um, beautiful, handmade, diverse dolls of color. Um, so yes, yeah, so glad to be here um, and just picking up these gems from Michael. So keep preaching, Michael. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> preaching to the choir, as they say, right? <laughs> Thank you for being here. Awesome. Um, Ayana. Yeah, no, maybe, oh, maybe unmute. All right, we'll go to um, Glenn. Yeah, my name is Glenn Clanton. My company is Do Something Solutions. I am a business coach. One of my clients is opening up a cannabis testing lab, and they've since asked me to join uh, the organization. 
Um, part of the challenge is it, it is a new business. It's a startup, uh, major capital investment, uh, looking at opening the facility in Michigan. And in Michigan, all cannabis products have to be tested before they go to market. Oh. Last year, Michigan did almost a billion dollars in cannabis business. All that product has to be tested. We're trying to get in on the ground floor, uh, but the going is tough trying to raise funds. So any advice and input I can get from this uh, session would be greatly appreciated. Great, thank you for sharing that. Okay, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, let's see, Rosalinda. Maybe I'm mute. Hey, Ed. Let's see. I just want a chance for everybody to kind of say hello and give us a little bit about your business. Um, uh, Pilar. I think people might be on mute. Yeah, people might be on mute. Um, Hi, this, sorry, this Rosalinda. Um, <laughs> you are, hello, hello. I, I do own a pharmacy. Um, so it's pretty much a customer based and it's been a hard season, but yes, I do own a pharmacy. It's been over 10 years now, so. Gotcha, and are you looking to expand? Um, um, I guess, are you looking to raise money to, to grow or? What's yes, your... I'm, I'm, I'm trying to raise money to, um, pretty much sustain my customers and try to bring them back or lure them back and let them not fall off with all the limitations we're going through now. Mm -hmm. At the same time, reach out to others as well. Gotcha, gotcha, okay, great, well, thank you. Um, and of course, um, Ed and Ayana, if you guys wanna jump in at some point, um, that would be great. Um, Michael, so I think it might be time to kind of get into it, right? And maybe start us off at the top of, you know, what makes a business um, funding ready, um, right? I think there's probably business, some personal stuff that entrepreneurs have to think about. Yeah, um, this is obviously a, a very complicated topic. And I think that there are both kind of strategic and functional things that you need to, to do in order to raise money. And I'm gonna start uh, a little bit with the, the the bigger picture things that really make all the difference in the world that, that tend to drive a lot of attraction. And, and here's the analogy that I'll use. If, if those of you are gonna go buy a house, right? And you, you fall in love with the house and you realize that the asking price is too high and maybe there's some work that needs to be done on the roof and you know, dot, dot, dot. If you really love that house, you tend to find a way around the asking price and the work that has to be done in the basement, right? In other words, you have a, a flawed house, but one that you love and that you can see the potential in, right? I can see raising a family here, I could see. And, and that's a lot of the way that investors think about things because it is very, very difficult to digest all the information that's being thrown at people when it comes to investing. So, so what does that mean? What it means that is that there's, there's really four, sometimes five factors that are really the reason why people get excited about something. And when they get excited about something, then you get into all the what's in the basement and what's the asking price. And, but, but if you don't get them to the point where they go, yeah, it's very difficult to get over those things because the world is so competitive. There's so much detail. There's always somebody with more money or somebody that's already doing what you're doing, right? If you don't get them to this thing where they go, yeah, all of those things are a little bit like death by a thousand cuts, right? If, if they do get to, yeah, then those things tend to be, they tend to roll off people's backs, right? And they tend to overlook them or they tend to say things like, oh, so with our capital, you would be able to address X and Y and Z. Okay, so here are a couple of those things. Number one is a big market, okay? And obviously when you're talking about, you know, like you, Glenn, like a cannabis market in Michigan, there's no, there's no question that there's a big market, right? And in many cases, that big market 
is one that you didn't even know about, right? So for example, did we know there was a big market for Uber at the time? Well, no. In fact, if we went back to the beginning before Uber existed and said, you're gonna pay somebody to get into a stranger's car, you would have laughed them out of the room, right? So sometimes defining this big market is a market that other people could, can't see. In our whole business, we, there were reward, reward programs everywhere. And for those of you who know us, you know, we started the first company to reward people for being healthy prior to Lonely Entrepreneur. And, and people were doing it everywhere, airlines, hotels, nobody was doing it in healthcare. But when people saw that, they're like, oh, that's a big market. Like, there's no doubt that that's a big market, right? Secondly was, do you have a unique approach to it? And, and this is obviously the hardest piece, right? Um, when there's big markets, a lot of people chase big markets, right? The question is, you know, do you have something where um, you're really standing out? And, and as, you, as many of you who, who have listened to us before, you know, we always talk about this playground where nobody else is playing, right? Basically defining it where you're the only game in town because you approach it a certain way or have a certain way of going about it. So for example, in my old healthcare business, right? Rewarding people for being healthy. There were reward programs everywhere. We just were the first to do it in healthcare. That was our playground, right? So you really have to try to find your unique niche um, and your unique playground. And, and that's the hardest part that takes creativity, creativity and thought. Um, so to our, like to our comments before, if it's something that's just different sprinkles on the ice cream cone, it's, that's not really a playground. That's things that other people are doing and people can do you know, maybe with, with more capital and more resources, right? So, so first is a big market. Second is what's your unique approach to the market? Uh, and that can be lots of different things, okay? The third is, you know, kind of any level of traction, right? What level of traction have you gotten to prove that you've made progress? Now, I can tell you that if you get number one and number two right, number three doesn't mean as much, right? If you get people to understand it's a big market, and you've got a unique approach to it. Um, I can tell you when, you know, Victoria, you mentioned, you know, when we raised money for Incent One for my old company, we raised a lot of money in just a couple of meetings on an idea because we didn't have that much traction yet. We just said, listen, if you believe rewarding people to be healthy is going to be part of the solution, then we're the company to invest in. If not, you shouldn't. And, and even though we didn't have that much traction yet, because number one and number two were so strong, you know, people tended to overlook number three, but I can tell you that number three, you know, is important. Okay. And remember investors discount when, you know, if you have a cookie shop and you're like, Oh, you know, my, my sister loves the cookies like that. That's not traction. Right. Um, traction is when you have, you know, kind of independent third parties that have said, yeah. Right. And obviously hopefully at, at some level of scale and frequency, right? So you have, you have big market, unique approach to the market or your own playground, you know, some level of traction. And then there's, there's two more. Um, obviously team is a big part of it. A lot of people say we invest in people because of who they are. I don't care what business they start. I've worked with these people before and in working with these people before, I know that they've performed in X and Y and Z, right? But a lot of times in early stage companies, we don't have all of that. We might have some of that, right? We might have a leader that has run companies. You might have a leader that is as an innovator in many different ways, shapes or forms, right? So there are lots of ways to, you know, for that team to come to life. It also can come to life in the form of a board of advisors where, you know, if you have significant people around you, right? That are, you know, kick-ass people, that is a demonstration of that, that, You've really got, you've really got something there. And then, and then finally is your business model, right? You might have the greatest business plot. You might have the greatest business in the world, but if you don't make money or somebody doesn't see how you can make money, if you sell something for a dollar and it costs you 99 cents, you can sell a lot of them, but an investor goes, eh, I can't, I don't see, we're gonna have to sell just a heck of a lot of those. Okay. So none of, none of the things that I'm saying are groundbreaking, okay? And if you look at a typical investor deck, a typical investor deck will have, you know, how big is the market? What's your unique approach to the market? What kind of traction you have? What's your business model? What's your team? 
and then a little bit more out there about you know what is your actual product and service um but you can probably tell that i didn't focus on the product or the service okay because there are a lot of people that can build products or services right um it's the ability to show a unique approach to that product or service like for example is the uber product or service that innovative right a little but not really right it just tapped into a market that was untapped and went up went about it in a in a unique approach okay so yes your product service product service matters and certainly if you're doing a consumer based business right um obviously your product service matters but a lot of times um you know if you're a food business it's the question isn't you know if somebody gets your food in their hands the question is how do you get it in their hands right what's your unique approach to getting it into their hands and how are you going to go about how are you going about doing that okay um the big market part is critical and sometimes it's defining a market uh, a different way i'll give you an example a company that we helped raise money was had a and i've mentioned this company before a subscription service for your pets right where you can basically pay a little annual subscription and you get the ability to solve a lot of the problems that you solve without going to the vet right the kind of non-medical issues which for any of you who are pet owners is like 99 of the issues happen with your pet you, you would never think you'd take them to the vet you only take them to the vet for the serious stuff and the market that they were defining was the veterinary market. We're going to go to the veterinary market and we're going to give them this. They're going to buy this solution and this solution will allow them to serve their clients without them having to come into the office. And we said, well, hold on a sec. That, that's a big market. Seems like it pretty big, but you have veterinarians and they don't necessarily have a ton of capital to invest or they can invest in their solution and why hadn't they, why hadn't they done that? It's a big market, but isn't the real market the 99% of things that you would never go to the vet for? Because when you measure that market, right? And we did the math. If we said every pet has two issues a month, could be what's the right leash, should be I ate the wrong food, you know, you name it. Two issues a month. The normal pet probably has two issues a day, right? But let's say it's two issues a month right, that you have to deal with, that you don't know what to do with. Well, when you multiply that out, it's a $40 billion market, okay? All that we, all we were doing was defining that market in a way that number one was big, but number two, our unique approach to it was like, we're not gonna go do the vet stuff, we're gonna do the stuff that vets don't do. And that was their unique positioning on it, okay? When you hear that and investors hear that, they go, yeah, that makes sense. I have a pet. I wouldn't know what to do with it. I would, I would just Google things, right? And then you go on to, okay, what's the products and services and what traction do you have? But, but when you hear that, you go, oh, yeah, I would do that, right? And, that's, and that gets people excited. And that's the example, though I fell in love with the house and now I'll figure out the rest of it, okay? Let me... Let me let me stop there for a second and see if anybody has any any questions or comments. Yeah, I was just going to say, folks, please don't be shy. This is a rare opportunity um, to ask, you know, specific questions around your business and what you're thinking around money raising. Um, Nicole, go ahead. I think that's a your hand is raised or that's a high five. Yes, yes. no, that's me. That's me. So, Michael, <laughs> let me ask you this in terms of, you know, excitement. I think, uh, you know, well, I guess it depends on who you're talking to, your crowd, but um, and, and your energy you bring to it, you know, people can get excited because uh, I feel like sometimes you bring the excitement to the table as the founder, right? And um, if you have your data backed up to show, hey, this could be exciting, then I think you can excite, um, you know, potential investors. My question is, like, how do you validate, you know, when you're trying to validate the market, I love what you said, like, you know, you don't really have to even focus on the product or the service, but the business model and the traction and the market, like, what if it's a niche? It is niche. Like, how do you determine, how do you, I guess, 
quanti quantify that niche to be worth their investment um, in, in okay. terms of like what they could get back out of it since it is like, at least I'm talking in particular about myself, you know, being okay. in a niche market. So let me tell you a little bit about excitement. Um, and a, a question for everybody. What percentage of early stage founders get in front of investors without excitement? None. None. Yeah, nada, nada. <laughs> nobody, nobody, right, that might be a good strategy. That might make you stand out, right? But, but don't think that excitement does everything because every entrepreneur comes to the table with passion and excitement. That's not what stirs the drink. What stirs the drink is when you say something where you don't have to convince them, but they, they're like, yeah, like the pet example, right? So don't, anybody that says to you, oh, they're just gonna see your enthusiasm come through, they get a thousand enthusiastic people in front of them. Now, don't get me wrong, you might find somebody that has the same mission, and like, sure, one in a hundred, but, but the excitement doesn't do anything. What gets people excited is about, oh, do I see that market where you go, oh yeah, that's a big market, and oh yeah, this is a unique approach to that market, okay, number one. Number two, the reality of the world that we live in is that, there aren't any more blockbuster drugs, right? There's niche drugs and peace drugs and this and it. It's just harder and harder to find um, a, a space that is like all encompassing because there's so many businesses out there. There's so much capital out there that just becomes hard. Rewarding people for being healthy was a, was a, it was a niche, Nicole. It just happened to be a big one. So it's better to be known for you know, I sell dolls to purple people and I'm the purple people doll person and I win that and then go on to selling it to red people and green people and blue people, right? It's, it's better to win a niche and to have a unique approach at a niche than it is to, to go in front of an investor and say, we'll do all this different stuff. Now, you, like you said, Nicole, you want to know that there's enough purple people, right? You want to know that the that the niche is big enough. And you can do some research around that and people also just intuitively, um, you know, kind of get that. But what I can say to you is, it is very difficult to create a very broad based business that doesn't have a niche, unless you just have a ton of capital. Right? I got you, I got you. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I everything I keep hearing, Michael, is niche, niche, niche. But then it's like, you know, finding the data on the niche can be a little bit of a challenge, like to say, you know, this could be worth X amount of dollars. You know, I'm trying to do that, that total uh, addressable market instead of yep. top down approach. Right. Yeah. So when I go approach my research, I'm like, oh, man, you know, I know how many black and brown moms there are potentially in the U.S. Um, and maybe in the world. Right. Let's expand it out. But I want to make sure I can quantify how much they are willing to spend, you know, on yeah. this category. So thank you. That's helpful. And I, I'll stay with my niche. <laughs> yeah, listen, people, people know niches before you even tell them there's niches, right? Because it's just what we know in our DNA, right? No one's, you, you just know, right? Like yeah. LGBTQ, you know, 10 years ago might not have been a niche, but now it is, right? And right. you don't need, you wouldn't need any numbers, right? To, to validate that. Now, if you said, what percentage of black and brown women buy dolls? Right. Yeah. You, you want to, you want to frame that out. Um, but frankly, Nicole, for your stuff that I think we've talked about this before, I wouldn't just be framing it around dolls. I would be framing it around the broader needs of this community around your brand and what you've created and, and what right, you've right. created. Right. So you, you guys can probably tell the way you define the market is often your playground where nobody else is playing and your niche. And, and you're just going, going about it. Like there's one, Victoria, you may remember this one. Uh, it was the car club, right? There was a bunch of gentlemen mm -hmm. in Chicago that wanted to create a new type of car club where you basically paid a subscription and you got a new car every month. Um, and, you know, and obviously some of these were luxury cars, stuff like that. And they, what they found was there was a lot of competition. So we started talking to them and we're like, let's find our playground. Let's find our playground where nobody else is playing. Great. So the first idea that came up was women. You're like, well, why don't we do a car club just for women? And you're like, okay, that's I'm almost at yeah. I don't know of too many car clubs for women. They're like, yeah, it's pretty good, but, but somebody could copy it, whatever. And we just happened to be talking about 
about Nashville. And we're like, well, how about a car club for women in Nashville? Let's go win that niche. So they went back, they realized that to win in Nashville, there was basically, you know, 20 organizations, the golf club, the social club where women hung out. And all of a sudden, the name's in the paper and they're the women car club. Not the women car club in Nashville, but the women car club. And now all of a sudden they can go to wealthy city X and wealthy city Y and wealthy city Z with already an established track record. And that's the kind of stuff that helps with investors as well. Okay, if you're gonna go big, you probably need $100 million. If you're gonna go niche, right? You can win and by winning, you can build on that to go into other, other segments and other niches. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Um, and Glenn, thank you for being patient. <laughs> Not a problem. Just got a quick question. Since we're looking at going into the lab business and all lab services are the same for all practical purposes, is the accuracy of, of, of your ability to test and the turnaround time. Yep. How do we create the uniqueness? Great question. Glenn, here's what I'd say. Where are you? You're up in Michigan. What part of Michigan? Well, we're, we're, we're opening the facility in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but all the team right now is in Atlanta. We're going to relocate. Gotcha. Gotcha. I did some business with a company called Health Plus that was up in Grand Rapids. Okay. I'm, I'm familiar with them. I saw yeah. them when I was in the airport recently. Yeah. So here's what I would say. Um, every single company out there is faced with a competitor that is almost exactly the same as them. It's just a world, it's a world we live in, right? right? Um, I hate to say this when there's women on the phone, but nobody needed to go out and buy another pair of black heels. Yes, they did. they're all different. <laughs> oh. um, and yet- <laughs> They do it all the time. People do it all the time, right? Um, please don't take any offense. Uh, <laughs> So, so have the perspective that everybody everywhere in any business is faced with a high degree of competition and somebody that's always willing to do it cheaper. Okay. Right. Which is the reality that we all work in. We right. can all get almost anything free except for heels. Um, <laughs> that, that being said, you say to yourself, okay, okay. It's lab testing. Right. But there are people on the other end that are that are um, in the cannabis business that have challenges, right? right? They're trying to figure out how to win government contracts, how to raise money, how to market, how to position, right? And if you as a lab provider show up and say, we do labs, great. If you show up in a, as a lab provider and say, here are five insightful things that demonstrate our know-how about the cannabis business that you should be thinking about, Right, and I'm I'm making this up, Glenn. Yeah. Don't don't set up your lab in 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 County X. Set it up in County Y. Yeah. Right, you have to bring a know how to the table that goes beyond just the the lab services. Okay, and and that's interesting because one of the growers I met with said, if you can provide education to our people so we know what we're doing better, and we can pass the state test easier, that's a value to us. Exactly. So. What I would say is think of it as beyond just sprinkles on the ice cream cone, right? Okay. So in other words, Glenn, not just the natural things, right? right. What you just described is a pretty natural thing, but, but even stretch yourself to go beyond the natural things that would not be right normal. So let's say, for example, um, you provided some type of clinical training. Let's say you did, you did management consulting. Let's say you did, again, whatever is required in the industry. Let's say you did um, real estate acquisition services. You did architectural design for the cannabis um, farms that are out. Like, like you know, I know I'm challenging you to say, you know, things not just on the sprinkles, but things that go, like what you should say in a sales meeting is, testing's all the same. We all do the same thing. Right. Right? The difference is we know this and we provide that, right? When my brother, my brother runs a property management business here in New York. He runs some of my family real estate and some other properties that he manages. And when he was looking to go out and say, okay, well, um, I want to do your brokerage services. If you're, if I'm managing your building, I want to do your brokerage services. And he wrote an email 
that he was going to use to do some of his digital marketing. And, the, and what do you think the email said? The email said, we're really good. We get the highest prices for everybody. Our clients love us. Well, what broker doesn't have that on their website? Right. Right. So same thing with you, Ben. It's like, it's like, right. All the testing services are the same. And I said, we were like, okay, but, but you're in a time of COVID. You have a situation where when people are buying into buildings, they don't really, aren't really that sure about the finances of a building, right? Because I'm talking about an apartment building, not a house, right? Because you don't know, have tenants not paid their bills, right? Have, have the commercial tenants not, you know, have they lost their leases because they couldn't afford to stay? There's only one party that really knows all those finances and can prevent you from having that risk. And that's your property manager, Right. So go out there and say, you shouldn't be using anybody but your property manager to buy in a building because they're the only ones that really know what's going on in the building. Okay, that's what every realtor in South Florida with the tragic you know, collapse of the building, right. no broker knows that. So, so it's that type of know-how, right? That, that Glenn, you almost have to make front and center right? Hey, before we talk about the testing services, are you guys doing these five things in your business? And maybe these five things are things that get into you into regulatory trouble, right? So it's not testing per se, but it's, you know what I mean? Compliance related. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay, so, so Glenn, I'm always trying to think about what's not just the ice cream cone. I'm sorry, what's not just the sprinkles, like what doesn't immediately come to mind? Cause that's what everybody else does. Um, but obviously you want to, you know, showing them how to make pizza probably doesn't do it. Um, but trying to find things where you stretch the value that you, that you wrap around your services. Good deal. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, think about every, every yoga structure in the world. Every yoga structure in the world had gone online. Now they're not just competing with the people that are down the road in Grand, Grand Rapids. They're competing with somebody online from Peloton and a yoga instructor in China. Right. How do they win? Right. It's, it's not by right, doing something to the classes. It's by providing something different. Right. Okay. And that's okay. really okay. And, and these type of go to market discussions are the same types of things that get investors excited because investors go, Oh, you're just like every other testing service. Right. Unless you've taken a unique to pro, a unique approach to it. Okay, and that's that same notion of, you know, how do I make sure that I have a, a playground where nobody else is playing where people could go, yeah, like I could see how they can win that. Like the, when I said car club, right, probably everybody on this phone was like, oh, that's not that interesting. There's lots of car clubs. And when you say car club and for women, you're like, oh, that's better. And car club women in Nashville. Okay, well, it's only Nashville, but yeah, but if you win Nashville, right, and you get a reputation in Nashville, you're one phone call away from being the car club in, you know, right. Absolutely. In your city. Okay. Yeah. There, there aren't as many blockbuster drugs. And if there are blockbuster drugs, you need a lot of money to address it. Thank you. Um, cool. Uh, v, any more questions? Not right now. Okay, cool. Um, I know that, People, very smart people give advice about a lot of different parts of raising money. And over the course of this series, we're going to talk about the materials you need and the, and the, the other things you need to be able to do. Um, but I really think people underestimate the effort around these themes like we're talking about today and the effort it requires to actually come up with something where you go, yeah because that will drive everything else. People focus on, I'm gonna make the deck and I gotta make sure the deck has all this other stuff in it. No one is paying attention to any of that stuff until you make them go, yeah. Until they believe the market's big and you have a unique approach to it, okay? No one is reading page 13. They'll read a hundred pages if you get them to go, yeah. Okay, I remember when, when we were doing our health rewards business, like every other industry uses rewards to drive behavior, healthcare isn't, and healthcare is spending $20 trillion on behavior. And they would be like, well, how are you going to approach this particular problem? We're like, we have no idea. We just need money to do it. Right? 
And if the market's big enough, right, and they believe you have a unique approach to it, which we did, right, then they'll actually help you through those problems. They'll say, I know a person would be great for you guys to, to, that you might want to talk to, right? Because they've gone on the other side of the fence. Now they're on that, wow, I really like this business. You know, there's a bunch of reasons that can happen along the way um, that, can, that can discourage them. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's, like we said in the beginning, it's hard to raise money. Um, but, but finding this playground, this unique niche and approach to it, that makes them go, yeah, that makes sense. Um, it is, it is the most important thing and it will, you know, grease the, every one of our early stage startups are, as we like to say, dogs with fleas, right? They all have fleas. The question is, do you get over the fleas just like you do with the house? Well, you do because you get excited about the opportunity, even though there are those, those, are, there are those fleas. Okay. Um, let me go on a little bit to you as the leader, because this is where I want to spend kind of the rest of the time here. Mm -hmm. um, raising money in an early stage company, especially if you haven't done it before, is an incredibly complicated thing to do uh, around a lot of the things we're talking about, but even specifically around just you and your own demeanor and your own personality. Okay. Um, what I would say is the following. Number one, you've got to be able to be kind of yin and yang in a bunch of different areas, okay? In one area, you have to be able to paint vision, right? You need to be able to say, right, this is where we're going to go. And that is aspirational. Sometimes it's inspirational, um, but it connects to these kind of bigger, bigger market forces. Um, secondly, is you need to be looked at as somebody that is going to have the focus, discipline, and experience to execute a plan with the money that's going to be given to you. Okay. So I'll use it. And if you don't have either, if you don't have those, right, it's very, very difficult to get somebody to give you money because the aspirational leader that doesn't have to execute a plan, people go, man, this, this guy or gal can really talk the talk, but can they, can they execute? Right. And on the other hand, you have somebody that can really um, execute, right? But do they have the vision of something that's big enough? Okay. Um, so you might say, Glenn, we're, you're doing it in Michigan, but we're going to go create the, 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 the Atkins seal of approval, right? We're going to convene a series of experts and we're going to have the definitive lab that does X and Y and C. And, and who knows, Glenn, maybe that's done already, but you have to have the vision to go bigger, but at the same time to say, with your $10, I'm going to do this and this and this. Okay. And those two things are very different skills. You may need help for you to present that. Okay. But when the entrepreneur comes to the table and says, I have this whole aspiration things, but when somebody says, who's your customer? And they say, everybody, investors tune out because they know that that's not the way the world works. You have to have a plan with your money. I'm going to do this. So really silly analogy. Um, hey, um, you know, if we had your money, we would like to be able to go to California. California is the land of riches and beaches and dot, dot, dot. We're going to go to California. So you have a vision. And somebody says, well, how are you going to get there? You're like, I don't know. I might drive. I might walk. I might swim. I might fly. Well, how long is it going to take? Well, I don't know. It might take a day or it might take a year right? When you don't have that second part, you're like, okay, I, I like this California thing. I want to go to California, right? Um, but if you said, we're going to go to California and what we're going to do with your money is we're going to fly from New York to Portland. And then we're going to drive from Portland to California. And the reason why we're going to do this is this and this and this, right? Then I can go, I like this California thing. And, and let me think about that plan. Okay. You've got to have this yin and yang of, of, of both, okay? You also have to have this very delicate balance of ego and humility, okay? Um, I said before that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're enthusiastic or not because, you know, most people are, but you do have to be able to convince people that they want to go to California. You do have to be able to convince people that, um, that 99% of the, 
things that pets deal with, nobody has an answer to, or that rewarding people for being healthy. And I could go on and on and on, right? You've got to be able to do it. And you have to have a healthy amount of ego to tell people that they're going to do things that they had never done before. Like a lot of times in our businesses, even when they're, you know, Nicole niches, we're still asking them to do stuff they haven't done before. And that requires a heavy dose of ego, right? But at the same time, you have to be humble enough to understand that, okay, we need your money because we don't have all the things that we need, including your skills as a leader. You might go, you know, I want to put a team around me because I'm the visionary. I've never run a company before, but with your money, I'm going to put in place a president or a COO or whatever. It has to come with that humility. I, I, I'll never forget. There was a, this is a great example of how all this stuff mixes together. There was a company, an MIT guy that had developed a whole bunch of a gaming app where you could bet on a whole bunch of things in the middle of a game, any kind of sporting event. And these are pretty common now, but it's going back five years or so. And he went to, you know, DraftKings, excuse me, and a couple of the other places, the big guys, really big guys, and about the technology, because the DraftKings technology was pretty old at the time, even though they're the, you know, one of the gorillas here in the market, their technology was pretty old. And they would go in and they would say, you know, we have new and innovative technology. And DraftKings was like, yeah, you know, we could do that. We haven't decided we want to do it yet. And this, this very enthusiastic MIT graduate would say, their technology stinks, we can do it better, we can do, and, and he lacked the humility to understand that, that somebody like DraftKings that was giving you $500 for your first bet, like had no shortage of capital, and if they wanted to, they could do whatever they wanted, right? That's not the answer. The answer isn't that not they get it and we're gonna do it better, right? We're gonna do it better than DraftKings. Okay, maybe, but, but then we said, well, wait a minute, like, like that's not a winner. Like you, you're gonna fight the biggest gorilla. Now, granted, should they be a customer of yours? Sure, but you weren't able to convince them that. And so we started to talk about the market. Well, why is DraftKings doing so well? Well, DraftKings is doing so well because somebody else is doing poorly and that are all the casinos where you used to have to physically go to Las Vegas, which you don't have to go to anymore. So imagine if you're a casino in Las Vegas, you're going, wait a minute, people just used to show up here Friday and we'd make a lot of money taking bets and now they don't need to do it anymore. We're like, that's who you have to go to who has no technology. Go to the casinos in Las Vegas and say, you should license this technology because now you're going to be able to compete with DraftKings. To the first, remember, same technology. To the first one, an investor would go, you're not beating DraftKings. They have too much money, right? To the second one, you're going them and they're like, we do not have a digital solution. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but has anybody made a bet with Harris in Las Vegas? I don't, I've never heard of that. They totally missed the boat. But if you went to them and said, I have this piece of technology that's going to put you on the map tomorrow because you can start taking bets and making money. To me, that's right. But, but he just kept fighting the fight because he wasn't humble enough to understand that, that people with a lot of money can do stuff. Okay. The, the thing that they're looking at, you know, I mentioned those couple of things, those five things. And one of the things is about the team. The most important member of the team is you. And in you, you've got to be really well trained to talk about the vision, make sure they get it, to talk about your plan and what you're going to do with their money, to, to be able to have this confidence that you're going from point A to point B, ego, and at the same time, the humility to understand, no, yep, we don't do everything well. What I always say to, to people raising money is, if you say you do something, they will evaluate how well you've done it. Right? If you said you've done consumer marketing, if you said you've done branding, if you said you've done technology build, they will say, awesome. Tell me what it's done. And in many cases, it hasn't done what you want because you don't have all the capital yet. If you say, we haven't really done it yet, that's why we need the money. And with the money, we're going to do step one, step two, step three. And here's why. Totally different dialogue. Okay. Because remember, our ego says we want to say we've done something. The reason why we're working 24 hours a day is because we're doing stuff. Right? But if you do stuff and the, and the results aren't there, which in many cases, they're not there for the right reasons because you don't have all the capital you need and the people you need. But then you have to say, listen, one of the big parts of our solution is the fact that we need to accomplish X and we haven't really been able to do that. 
because we haven't had the capital. And that's one of the reasons we're, we're coming to ask you for money. Okay. One of the hardest parts about this is this is much more chess than checkers. Like this is not rote linear. You walk in, you really have to be well-trained to talk to investors, to be able to, to communicate what you need to communicate. Yeah, I was just going to say, right, so many times we hear entrepreneurs and they get either nervous or super excited and it just becomes a little bit of a verbal diary, excuse my French, right, because they they lose the perspective like, okay, this is what the investor needs to hear, right, and this is what they want to hear versus all the kind of details and information the entrepreneur has. Yeah, I think, I think the, that the way somebody said this to me a long, long time ago, it really stuck with me. You have... You have 15 minutes. I don't care if the hour, I don't care if the, the, the meeting is an hour or two days. You have 15 minutes where they're going to give you their brain space. If that even, right? Because sometimes it sounds like these meetings can be a lot shorter. Yeah. Um, and for those people who have run businesses, a lot of investors are incredibly respective of the effort and how difficult it is to, to raise money. But whether they're there and smiling with you or there and being polite to you, you have 15 minutes. If you want to fill those 15 minutes with the weather, right, or how you broke your computer or how your first intern spelled things wrong, like, like you can spend it on whatever you want to spend it on. What I would suggest is you need to spend it on the things where they go, yeah. All the details of the product, the service, how you got there, how all the sausage was made, how many employees didn't work out, you know, blah, 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 blah. You can spend it on that if you want, but I can tell you that you need them to be able to walk away, right? With them going, okay, this, I get what they're doing. Once they do that, you know, they will read slide 13. They will open up the car manual and read the details. If they don't do that, they'll be polite for the next, the rest of the meeting and they won't really do it. And, and you'll know, because the reason you'll know is they will tell you, they will say, I need that house. And, and, and they won't tell you they're going to, they'll be like, all right, let's get a follow-up. Let my people in there. Let's, let's start to dig in a little bit. Right. Because they realize that if, if, if you've, I remember what I'm talking about is hard to do. So if they see a hundred investments, one, they go, yeah. When they see the one, they go, yeah. They're like, I, I want, I need that house. <laughs> right. And then you're, you're changing the dynamic of everything that's going on. Okay. There are no magic pills to this. It is it requires entrepreneurial creativity and finding these, these pockets where you are the only game in town. And they're like, wow, nobody, nobody is doing it like these guys. Any questions? Great insights, Michael. Um, I'm, I got my hand up, Victoria. I'm yep, jumping yep, back yep. in. If Go that's ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Nicole. Yep. <laughs> so you know what, Michael? Yes, 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 yes. Everything you're saying, I'm picking up what you're putting down. My question is this. Should you target who you'd like to get in front of? Like I have a list of like my top 10 um, you know, uh, uh, ideal like VCs or angel investors. And then like now I'm stalking people to like get in front of them. But should you have that list? Because obviously I, I feel like I want to also align and, you know, they invest in so many different companies. So I also want to be someone that they like might find valuable to their portfolio. Would that matter as well to see, you know, if they're interested or to get that, you know, initial conversation on the books, so to speak? Yeah. So Nicole, I think you've identified one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make. And that is that investors invest in certain ways of certain sizes, certain industries based on their, their goals, right? So, so who you go after is hugely important because you can chase VCs, but what you need to know is, are these VCs that invest in these types of businesses? What is the actual size of checks they write, what are the criteria of companies that they go that they go after? Are they only going after companies that have 10 million in revenue? I can't tell you how many times you know companies go after investors that just aren't appropriate for them because they don't do their work. Right. Um, that's even more important when it comes to earlier stage investment and talks to like friends and family and angels. Mm -hmm. Right. If if you're talking about raising a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, you know a, a a moderate amount of money, the people that you're talking to and the way that you're talking to them, right? 
is different than when you talk to VCs, right? If you talk to, if you talk to a real estate investor, many, many real estate investors are like, how much is the rent? How much does the water cost? How do we get our money back? Mm-hmm. Right? If you talk to you know, Silicon Valley VCs, they wouldn't even take that conversation because they want things that are going to go big or go home. So right. Nicole, right. think about how much you're raising, the mm-hmm. industry you're in, and do your work. Do not think, no offense to anybody here, mm-hmm. do not think that people will go outside their investment criteria just for you. Yeah, yeah. That's honest. That's fair. Right. And that's what I've been using, like, as my evaluation, like, and looking like, what do they already have in their portfolio? You know, yeah. who have they already invested in? Do they have something that's similar to what I'm doing? It, then they might not be interested because they already got it in their portfolio, you right. know? So those right. are really key. Thank you so much. Cause I'm like, I want to go after people that I think align also with like, just what I feel are our overarching mission, vision and values are too. You know, because if they're going to be giving me money, I need to like them. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, you know Nicole, that's going to come next. But I think matching the criteria, I don't know what the percentage is, but if I had to guess, I bet you that 50% of the investor conversations on the planet are made to investors are not really appropriate for the purpose they're going to. Okay. It's just because Thank people you. don't, people don't think about, you know, is this VC, is this angel network, you know, is this, um, you know, friends and family person, you know, if you, if you're going after, you know, somebody who's friends and family and they've operated a donut shop, um, you know, offering them a technology business is hard. Right. Cause it's not something they know. So being discerning about who you talk to, um, is, is a hugely overlooked part of that. So thank you for asking that question, Nicole. Yeah, no, I listen, I could talk to you all day, Michael. <laughs> so I appreciate it. My last part of that, and if anybody else doesn't mind, is when do you decide to do this? Because I've been bootstrapping the last year and bootstrapping sucks. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, when do we transition to knowing like I need 100K, I need it for X, Y, and Z, and I need it by this date to make this happen? You know, when do you go out in, into the world and start putting that on onto the platforms, you know, that you have available to pitch? Sure. Um, so it's all about the goals that you set. So for example, um, what most entrepreneurs don't do is set a goal, let's say out three years, let's say three years from now, Nicole, you wanted your business to do a million and a half in revenue and you wanted to net half a million dollars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You'd say, great. So, or you said, I want to sell my business in five years for $10 million. Yeah, that sounds like it, Michael. You're on point. (laughs) And you say, okay, how are business, you know, to sell it for $10 million, I would have to get to this level of revenue and this level of earnings. So if you don't lay out your, where you want to go, right. It's very difficult to answer the question, but if you said, okay, let's use that example. I want to be a million and a half in revenue Uh in in three years, which means, you know, next year I'm going to be half a million. The year after that, I'm a million. The next year, I'm going to be a million and a half. Great. That's my plan. That's where I want to go because I want to make half a million dollars in three years. Great. Yeah. What do I need to get there? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I need I need to spend a certain amount on a head of marketing, right? I need, yeah. to, I need to spend a certain amount on digital marketing. I might need a, a partnership or a salesperson to do that, to do X and Y and Z. And when I put all that together, I need to raise half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. If your plan was to turn this into a hundred million dollar company because you want to have it sell in every retail store in the country, you need more money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If your plan is to go from selling fifty thousand dollars to eighty thousand dollars to one hundred ten thousand dollars to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, maybe you don't need any money at all. But the point is, when do you go ask for money? is Mm -hmm. the first thing you should say to yourself is what is your goal like three years out? Where do you want to be? And then you work backwards and say, what are the resources that I need to be able to do that? If you have, if you do that analysis and then you say, yeah, you know what? I just don't, I, I, I don't have the relationships or the wherewithal to raise a million dollars. Then you might say, okay, maybe I need to scale back my goals. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. But not doing that and just bootstrapping right? You will, mm-hmm. you'll have what everybody has, big vision, 
right? Bad execution. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to work, you got to work the plan. The plan has to work for you. I'm a project manager by day. So this is like nothing to me. Like this is second nature to me to make a plan, but yep. you need the team behind you to create, make the plan happen. Unless you're, you know, you can only be a solopreneur for so long when you're trying to scale yep. and grow. Yeah. Um, so thank you. I don't want to hog your time, Michael. You're the best. Thanks so much. No, you're so sweet. Well, listen, um, these recordings will be available. We're going to do a series of these. Um, and I know that you know, everybody are at different stages. Some people are just thinking about it. Some people are, are deep into it. Um, uh, what I can tell you is that, I'll leave you with this, you know, for every 10 businesses out there, one will always work because it's such a good idea. One will never work because it's such a bad idea. And the other eight, it's all how you do it. So when people talk about raising money, these things that we're talking about here and the ability to elucidate them in a way that compels people, when people get compelled, they buy things, write checks, move mountains and buy houses maybe they shouldn't buy, right? And those, that's the most important part of, uh, of raising money. Awesome. This has been very insightful. Thank you. Thank you everybody for taking time and these will these recordings will be available in the in the learning community for everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks Ayana for the note. <laughs> Thanks for your time everybody. Thanks guys. You're the best. You Have a good one. Thanks Nicole. Bye-bye.